what I want to do today is to continue with that outline. I just, I just have a few minutes here, so I'll get a little bit further through it, and then there'll probably be another recording uh, to finish it up. Um, okay, let's share our screen. So we left off with uh, Charlemagne, and as I was saying, you know, this is kind of a, a big uh, legitimization of feudalism, which existed before, but now became more institutionalized and, um, and formalized. And so we have this, uh, you know, this is a Francia, uh, these colored portions. So, um, you know, London is up here. This is Angleterre, is England, and Spain is down here. And then this is modern day France. And that's where Francia was. And Charlemagne was the king of Francia. And this is sort of what it looked like when Charlemagne um, took the throne. Um, and then what he did then was to consolidate a larger portion, this purple area, this darker purple, um, all the way down into Italy and uh, consolidate all this under the Holy Roman Empire. And this was something that he, uh, he was able to negotiate with the Pope and the Pope said, okay, I'll make you a Holy Ro Roman Emperor. So we'll reinstitute the um, uh, the emperorship uh, of Rome, but now is the Holy Roman Empire that is uh, devoted to Catholicism and and where the Pope, you know, plays a, a major political role. And uh, and then and then at this time, you know, we still have notice here. It's it's noted as the Byzantine Empire. The Roman Empire still exists. Okay, uh, but now it's, they have in the West, they have the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. And uh, so we have this, uh, you know, this hierarchical structure. So this is a big part of feudalism is that um, society is organized, at least ideally, in an in a absolute pyramid structure with the emperor at the very top and then below that minor kings and then below each king they have their their uh, dukes and then below those are knights and you know and then some other minor uh, you know variations of that um, but that's the that's the basic structure and in the holy roman empire it became formalized as the king uh, Charlemagne is at the top. Uh, you have ecclesiastical princes, so those are actually abbots um, uh, or cardinals, uh, archbishops within the Roman Catholic Church that are integrated into this hierarchy. Notice that they're given a high position, at least on paper, right? Uh, technically, they're like the second rung. And this is part of feudalism is that technically high ranking members of the Roman Catholic Church are right below the king. In reality, they didn't have that much power. Um, but, but as an honorary sort of position, they're given second rank. Um, and then you have secular or lay princes below those, counts and barons and ministerials, uh, vassals of the ministerials. So this, you know, you just get layers upon layers of in this pyramid structure. And then we have free knights. Um, and this is how, you know, military service was uh, rewarded and paid for is knights who were valuable uh, in the military, uh, you know, highly valuable, were given fiefs, were given land 
that they ruled over, uh, but then they couldn't they couldn't parcel that out to other people below them. Uh, so that was kind of the ground level. And and some of these higher ranks m might be people who were involved in the military, but they also have also had hereditary um, status in, as aristocracy, and so they're higher up in the hierarchy. Okay. Um, so the, the, the takeaway there is that feudalism becomes very formalized as a pyramid structure. And, um, and it's a pyramid structure based on holding land. And, um, and I'll talk about this a little more later, but, but at this point, it's a pyramid structure based on holding land. And really, uh, all land is held in the person of the king and then he grants holdings to other people further down uh, right below him. And then those people can grant holdings out of their, their land and split it up however they think until you get to those free nights. And, but nobody really owns the land. The notion of property as, as we know it uh, today didn't exist technically within feudalism. Nobody owned the land. The king belonged to the land. The land belonged to the king, but he didn't own it. He can just do whatever he wanted with it. Um, although they had a lot of authority to do whatever he really wanted to it, but in principle, he couldn't do whatever he wanted with it because he was always uh, nurturing the land and the people of the land. And that sort of carried down at each level. So. Uh, the king could revoke a holding at any time, uh, unless there's some legal contract that was specified, you know, uh, either holding in perpetuity or a specific time period. Um, okay, so, uh, so then right about this time that Charlemagne is getting things organized, um, the Vikings are, are, are raiding uh, various portions of Europe. At first, mostly outside of the Home Holy Roman Empire. So that's one thing that Charlemagne had going for him in terms of legitimacy is that he could secure the Holy Roman Empire against the Vikings, who, you know, um, were very much, you know, like the sort of stereotypical picture of the Vikings, they, they would raid and, and pillage, they just show up out of nowhere, out of the sea, and invade uh, uh, an area and just take over very rapidly. Sometimes they, or often, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't hold land, they would just come and raid and then take off. So they're kind of like pirates or, or raiders. Uh, but then eventually they did start to hold land, especially in England, uh, during this Viking Age, um, a large section of England was held by Viking Danes, uh, they're Danish, and uh, they ran that portion of England like a colony uh, for the Danish king. Uh, and then about 150 years after Charlemagne, uh, we have this medieval warm period. And during this period now, the Vikings become more aggressive and the Holy Roman Empire, you know, Charlemagne's gone at this point, but uh, the Vikings raid all the way up to Paris. So they, they, they sail up the Seine to Paris and, and, uh, and are able to uh, sack Paris in a way and pillage and uh, and then they just took took off. Uh, but um, that that order that Charlemagne was able to establish, you know, that shows a big weakness. And uh, so the Vikings were, you know, a big problem for the midi the feudal order. But nonetheless, that model of Charlemagne did become very popular all around Europe. And then about uh, 1050, 
we have the east-west schism of the church. So uh, remember I said that the, the Pope liked to call himself the Papa, the, the, the patriarch of the patriarchs. And that eventually led to a schism between the Western Roman church based in the city of Rome and the Eastern church based in the remaining portion of the Eastern Roman Empire and places that had even fallen uh, to uh, Islamic, the Islamic Caliphate. And, and um, so that you have, uh, you have some of the Eastern Orthodox churches uh, in Islamic territory. Okay. And, and they, they were able to practice in the Islamic, uh, the Islamic empire was very, or was somewhat, let's say, somewhat tolerant uh, of non-Islamic religions. Um, and people practicing Christianity in the Islamic empire were, you know, had legal protection and, and all that sort of thing. Um, okay, so the, so the church splits and right about this, and, and so from then on we have Roman Catholicism versus Eastern Orthodoxy. The Eastern portion of the empire is called, you know, that church is called Eastern Orthodox Church. And then the Roman Catholic, and Catholic means universal, the Roman Universal Church uh, is based in Rome and, and they have divergent theology. Um, in terms of the Arian versus Monousian debate, Roman Catholicism develops the notion of the Trinity as if anybody's familiar with that, the way that is normally understood in the United States. Whereas in East, Eastern Orthodoxy, Jesus is seen as more human than the way that Jesus is portrayed in Ro Roman Catholicism. So Roman Catholicism begins to, you know, diverges in this Christology this person of Jesus, making Jesus more very close to God, or, you know, um, essentially God, but also human. And it's kind of a mystery, as they like to say. In Eastern Orthodoxy, they are a little more ambiguous about the state of the essence of Jesus and whether he's all God or all human, they leave it as a more loose uh, interpretation. So that, that's one of the big issues that they split on. And, you know, primarily the split was that the Pope, you know, wanted more power. Okay, so he just sectioned off his own portion. Uh, and, then, and then most of Europe, um, most of Western Europe, what we consider Western Europe today, was Roman Catholic, uh, like it just was. Uh, where feudalism existed, it was Roman Catholicism. There was no choice among religions. That's just all, that was religion, that was it. Uh, in Eastern Europe and in Russia, and then in these uh, places like Egypt, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy uh, continued on. Okay, then uh, in 1066, we have William the Conqueror. This is a big turning point in English history. And again, we're kind of thinking from a perspective of England because that's where Marx is, you know, that's his sort of historical perspective. And uh, William the Conqueror, you know, conquers England. That's why he's called William the Conqueror and becomes William the First, uh, the first uh, of the monarchs of England. So, um, all right, so I am out of time. I got to jump on another Zoom meeting, so I will continue on in another video. Thank you. See you later.